the summer sun, warm hot days. Does this bring up thoughts of beaches, ice cold drinks, topping up your tan? Or does it bring up thoughts of thermal expansion, ballast profiles, joint gaps and heat speeds? If it's the latter, then you've more than likely spent some time working on the railway, and I hope you have not had the misfortune to have to deal with a track buckle. But why do railway tracks buckle? Well, by the end of this video, you'll be able to explain it. Before we dive into that, what do we mean when we say a track buckle? A buckle is when the track becomes misaligned due to heat-related forces, frequently leading to an S-shaped look to it. This misalignment, depending on the severity, can have serious consequences, such as derailments. To understand why track buckles occur, first we need to dive into some material science and get an understanding of thermal expansion. Most common materials expand when exposed to heat, such as the sun on a hot summer's day, and contract when cooled. They will contract further when exposed to cold temperatures, such as when it's frosty. The steel used to manufacture rails is no different. The amount a certain material expands or contracts is governed by two factors. First is the change in temperature experienced by the material, noted as a change in or delta T. This is simply the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Second is the coefficient of thermal expansion, which is specific to that material. It can be found on manufacturer's documentation, from universally accepted standards, or experimentally. For rail, which is made of steel, the coefficient is 0 0.0000115, or 11.5 times 10 to the minus 6. The coefficient allows expansion to be calculated based on changes in temperatures. It can be surprising how much expansion can occur. Let's run an example. A rail is installed at 0 degrees with a length of 18.288 metres. 0 degrees makes the calculation a bit easier, and 18.288 is a standard supply length of rail. If the rail is installed in the winter, hence the 0 degrees, how long would it be during the hot weather of the summer when the rail temperature is at 40 degrees? So, change in length equals the coefficient times the original length, converted into millimetres, times the change in temperature. Let's plug the numbers in, and that gives us a change in length of 8.4 millimetres. This shows how much a rail can change in length with a change in temperature. If that is a rail of just over 18 metres, imagine how this compounds over longer distances. Also bear in mind the range of temperatures that rails will be exposed to. This is all relative to the local climate. Take the UK, the temperature range considered to be standard is minus 14 degrees up to 53 degrees. Within continental Europe, this can be pushed minus 30 to 60 degrees. It's worth noting that these ranges are likely to increase, given the move towards more extreme weather being driven by climate change. So now I hope you have an appreciation for thermal expansion. Let's look at why it's important. There is a key point to everything we've looked at so far, and that is the rail is free to expand unobstructed. This would be true on a railway at adjustment switches or in jointed track, where gaps are designed in to allow for this expansion. But in continuously welded rail, there are no gaps, so the rail is constrained at both ends, meaning it must stay the same length. But what about the expansion, which we have seen can be significant? Where does it go? The answer is the rail goes into compression, meaning the rail is squeezed into a smaller length than it naturally wants to be. This generates forces trying to get the rail to its desired length, known as compressive forces. We can work out the force in the rail using a few key pieces of information about the rail itself, and the steel it's made of, as well as some material science concepts. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, so for more information check out the engineering concepts videos on this channel, or give them a Google. So the equation we're going to be working with is force equals strain times the cross-sectional area times the modulus of elasticity. So let's break that down. Strain is a measure of how much a material deforms. It is calculated by the change in length over the original length. Sound familiar from the earlier part of this video? Through the wonders of maths, we can sub in the coefficient of expansion times by the change in temperature to make a formula generic for use in a number of different situations. The cross-sectional area is an area of a slice of the rail. In this case, if we take 756 or 113 pound rail, it is 7,184.5 millimeters squared. Lastly, the modulus of elasticity. This is also known as Young's modulus. Again, another concept to check out the videos or Google for. In short, it is a property of the material that quantifies a material's resistance to deformation when force is applied to it. So back to the equation. Let's look at how much force that 40 degree change in temperature would give. Plugging in the numbers gives us a force of 660,974 newtons. Converting that into tons, check out Google, 
gives 67.4 tons of force. That's a pretty big number. So we can see that this is a large amount of force and that needs constraining. The force restraining the rails needs to be greater than the compressive forces in the rail to stop the track buckling and the compressive forces being released. So how's this done? We're going to look at this in two parts. First part, the track system construction and then stress-free temperature. We'll look at the track system construction first as this goes for all track construction types. Even if the track is jointed, there may come a time when the expansion is such that the joints close up completely, which means compressive forces start to build. The way the rails are stopped from moving is down to one main thing, mass or weight. As I said, the force restraining needs to be higher than the forces in the rail. Or another way of thinking of it is the forces in the rail need to be big enough to move the track. This means pushing ballast out of the way, moving sleepers. Quite an ask on a track with a full ballast profile. This is the reason that concrete sleepers are also preferred over wood, they're heavier. But remember the path of least resistance. Buckles, when they do happen, tend to occur where there is a weakness, such as a wet bed with little or no ballast, a low ballast shoulder, or near a feature on the track that concentrates the forces. Typically you get these at the edge of bridges or between sets of points that are close to each other. So if the track system as a whole is about weight, then stress-free temperature is back to material science. For continuous welded rail, there is no allowance for expansion for the long lengths of rail involved. Even a small increase in temperature would lead to a large amount of force. The opposite to compression is tension. An object is put into tension by pulling it to increase its length. This also stresses the material. The forces in the rail at this point are wanting to pull the material back to its original length. Between compression and tension is a neutral point where there is no force or stress in the material at all the stress-free temperature. So this is where stressing comes in. To stop compressive forces developing as quickly, rails are installed in tension by stretching them and then welding them up. It is effectively installing the rail at a length it would be at a certain temperature. In the UK, this is 27 degrees. In the US, it's around 20 to 24 degrees and Germany around 20 to 22 degrees. These are known as stress-free temperatures or SFTs and are based on the climatic conditions of the area. Let me know in the comments if you use a different SFT in your country or if those ones that I've quoted aren't quite right. I'm really interested to see that. This means that the rails don't go into compression until the rail temperature exceeds this figure, thereby reducing the forces significant. This works well to manage thermal forces in rails, mitigating the risk of buckles. The only time it does become an issue is at the extremes of temperatures. At low temperatures, the tensile forces are high, which can lead to rail breaks, and in high temperatures, well above the SFT, the risk of buckles is still there. Stressing does mean that that risk is moved to a considerably higher temperature though. So, time to sum up. Buckles occur when compressive forces within the rails generated by the increase in temperature overcome the forces opposing them. These forces can be considerable when temperatures climb. The risk of a buckle can be mitigated by ensuring correct ballast profile to resist the forces in the rails. Rails can also be installed in tension to reduce the compressive forces. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it's been informative and I hope it's given you an insight into why we have buckles on the railway. Please do give the video a like if you found it useful. Give the channel a subscribe so you don't miss out on all the new videos that I've got planned coming through. And any questions or comments, let me know below. Thank you.